Hi, folks. Hi, guys. My name is Magda Wojciechowska, and we've got an honor to open this eighth conference of European Society for the Study of Symbolic Interaction uh, here in Łódź. Just to start, I give you Professor Krzysztof Konecki, Vice Dean of the Faculty of Sociology uh, and Economics, and also the President of our Polish Sociological Association. Okay, thank you, Magda. This is um, our main organizer. If you have some problems, then please ask Magda for solving them, not me. Um, okay, uh, welcome to Łódź, to the conference. You see the uh, name of the conference, the topic. Uh, Studying everyday life, generic dimension of interactionist inquiry. It's not accident that uh, the conference is in Łódź. We have some tradition here of um, uh, practicing and developing uh, symbolic interactionist theory and research style, Chicago style. Then uh, it's a good place that the conference finally came to this city and we can develop the Chicago School of Łódź. I think that something like this may be developed in the future. Uh, then I'd like to uh, welcome very important persons that came to this conference. They are keynote speakers and um, also, first of all, uh, Andrea Salvini, the president of European uh, uh, SI. Welcome, professor from Pisa, University of Pisa. <laughs> Another keynote speaker. And I welcome also all the members of the um, European Triple SI. Uh, I'm happy having you here. Uh, next, uh, Robert Proust from University of Waterloo, Canada. <laughs> welcome. We know the books of Robert here, and he is supporting us, uh, especially qualitative uh, sociology review and uh, our endeavors and uh, all activities that we do here in symbolic uh, interactionism. Thank you, Robert, for coming. Uh, welcome, Kaja Kozimierska, uh, director of uh, our university, yeah, our uh, institute. Uh, not yet, not yet. <laughs> this mistake uh, expressed my willings. Uh, I want uh, Kaya became rector. Uh, okay, next, Vesela Misheva. Where are you, Vesela? Okay, but I welcome her also uh, from Uppsala University, Sweden. Joseph Kotarba came from the far away country. Uh, fortunately, uh, he came before uh, president of US uh, because there will be less crowd on the airport. It was uh, less crowd on, on the airport. Uh, Robert Dingwell, welcome. Oh, okay, Robert. Uh, University of Nottingham, UK and uh, a chair of uh, Symbolic Interactions, Interaction uh, Journal. Uh, Scott Grills, welcome, although he is absent today, traveling extensively around Poland. Maybe he can hear me somewhere. From Brandon University, Canada. And I'd like to thank for organizing this, all the activities that we have here to Magda Wojciechowska to did a lot of work and also Anna Kacperczyk that is uh, responsible for, uh, for one of the exhibition and uh, for the visualization of the conference and she's also um, chair of 
section of symbolic interactionism and qualitative sociology, section of Polish sociological association. Then we have here some connections between uh, these organizations and uh, it's, uh, they support us also triple, this original American uh, triple SI support or also this uh, conference uh, financially and I'd like to thank to the uh, this organization and uh, representatives of these organizations uh, that we have here also. And uh, the, the whole conference with the exhibitions and with workshops that we will have here uh, are organized uh, in the project, the special project of um, publicizing uh, or promoting of science. This project was financed by uh, Ministry of um, uh, Higher Education and also a Dean of uh, the faculty subsidized this conference. I'd like to thank uh, also to the Dean uh, and I'd like to thank also to um, Polish Sociological Association that uh, supported it at its uh, under the emblem of uh, Polish Sociological Association. Uh, wait a minute, I should thank to the president. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and I'd like to thank also to the uh, whole team uh, from our Department of Sociology of uh, Organization and Management. They are here. Uh, they, and the students, PhD students that helped in the organization of this conference a lot. That maybe... <laughs> and welcome all of you to this conference and to this wonderful city that reminds maybe uh, some people uh, Chicago, maybe not exactly with architecture, but with the social structure and such a special zones that we can find here. Uh, that Tadeusz uh, mentioned today that he noticed even being one day here, then, but he's ethnographer. Then thank you Tadeusz for the starting of the research in this city. We will continue this. And I'd like to invite Andrea Salvini, our president, for a few words to say. So a few, few words to, to say thank you very much, first of all, to the University of Łódź that, and to the Department of Sociology and Management uh, that is guesting us. And thank you very much to Christoph that is a wonderful and excellent uh, organizer um, and uh, obviously a scholar. And I must say also a very good friend. And I prefer to speak about <coughs> not important persons, but a community of people and community of friends that each year since uh, 2010, but probably since uh, the, the end of 90s in Nottingham was the first European conference, maybe, if I well remember. And then in 2010 in Pisa, and then each year, uh, we proved to be able to organize a conference here, there, in Europe concerning symbolic interactionism and symbolic, the historical tradition uh, uh, of symbolic interaction, interactionism, but also um, uh, methodological uh, basis of uh, constructionist research and so on. And probably you gave a look uh, to the program and I must say that each year the conference are always increasing in richness in, um, in different kind of uh, themes of issues that are treated and in different um, uh, in, in different uh, country that uh, from where people are, are coming. So we have friends coming from United States and I greet them and I say welcome uh, as 
so to say, the president of the European Board, and I say welcome to you all to, to be here and to contribute to the parallel session and to the plenary session. And I would like to stress that this is the second year that um, Symbolic Interactionist Conference is organized in East Europe. And I think it's a very, very important thing. Because in, in, uh, in this way, think, I, I think that uh, symbolic interactionism proved to be a truly international um, organization. And I think this is important also from, uh, also from in some sense, a, theor a theoretical point of view. I remember an article of a friend of ours, that is Philip Vannini, in which he wrote that uh, there was a, a sort of uh, amnesia in uh, symbolic interaction in society. Uh, that means that uh, symbolic interaction in is understood as a typical um, American perspective. And obviously it is true considering the roots and considering the, the way in which uh, it develops in, in times. But we have to say that uh, symbolic interaction in, uh, now is able to spread uh, in the whole world and especially in Europe. And I think that is a point that we have to remember. And another thing, uh, let me congratulate once again with Christoph for having organizing this conference and for becoming the president of the Polish Sociolo Sociological Association. And I, and I think that he is um, a must in, uh, in a special person in the Polish tradition that we all know uh, in, in the entire world. So thank you very much to Christoph and thank you very much to you all for being here. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now we are coming back to the rules and origin of the uh, symbolic interactionist, uh, Robert uh, Proust. Welcome. Please come here and give us a speech. Robert worked a lot as an ethnographer. We know his books very well in here in Łódź. And now you tell something more about theoretical, what I understand. Theoretical, meta-theoretical uh, background of the ethnographic research. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. I will. Use this, or I can use you. You can sit here or use this. Okay. I like to stand. Okay. Then I can see you all better. Are you able to hear me? Okay. Everything's good. Okay. Well, um, the uh, paper is, as you probably know, is entitled "Scholarship as a Community Engaged Process: The What, How, and Exceptional Potency of Pragmatist uh, Interactionist." informed ethno-historical sociology. Uh, but first, uh, before I go to the paper more directly, I'd like to tell you that I'm really very, very happy uh, to be with you uh, today. Actually, I'd be happy to be with you all most any day, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, uh, I had just a brief chance to uh, uh, become familiar with the city of uh, Woods. I always have to think Hollywood, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, it, I, I, I realized that it's a place I would like to spend, if I could, at least a month or two months, just becoming more familiar with the city, both the tourist area and the other parts. Uh, and of course, uh, it does, uh, as uh, Thaddeus Miller had mentioned earlier, uh, it reminds you in many ways of Chicago in terms of its development and the different regions and, and sectors. And uh, of course, wherever people are, I can have a nice time. The disadvantage is that my Polish is really, really limited. Uh, 
Thank you, Jing Queer. That's that's pretty well <laughs> it. And uh, 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 Dabre, you know, it's good. Uh, but uh, to be able to relate to people, it's really most effective if you do have the language that they're using. And I hope, amongst other things, that students from the University of of Wuj would spend more time in, in, in their own community reaching out, uh, talking to the merchants, talking to the people in construction and development, just like they were doing at the University of Chicago uh, at the early part of the 19th century where they in, envisioned the city uh, as their own laboratory their own sociological laboratory. And of course, I, I would hope that every uh, community has a number of symbolic interactionists who could do uh, such a, a project, provide that, that service uh, for people. Um, it, as I indicated in the very last uh, page, uh, very briefly, I, I really would like to express uh, my gratitude uh, uh, to Professor Konecki, um, uh, to uh, uh, Anna uh, Kapersik. I hadn't had the chance to say your name in public. But, you know, I, I was doing a, a, a paper on, on Thucydides, and I, I'd read the name many, many times, and then I realized I never pronounced Thucydides before. <laughs> You see, because it's, it's one thing to read it and attend to the letters, uh, uh, but uh, yes, and uh, Lucas Mars Marciniak, uh, you know, uh, starting a, a qualitative sociology re review, to me it, it's uh, an area of scholarship that takes a lot of courage, uh, a lot of dedication on the part of the participants, and uh, it, it's so nice to, to see it uh, develop. You know, we, we have three major journals in symbolic interaction. Um, there's one that's called Symbolic Interaction. Uh, then there's the uh, uh, Journal of Contemporary Ethnography. And now, you know, Qualitative Sociology Review is really quite well known in North America as well. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see that. Now, personally, I, I think of qualitative sociological review as kind of a beacon. It's an open access journal, which is, which is great, uh, but also it, it uh, has this international quality uh, or transnational, whatever you like, and uh, I, I'm very happy uh, uh, to, to see that. Um, Scholarship, you know, that, that's something that's often taken for granted, and especially for students. Uh, they don't really enjoy going to school all the time. And they, they well, it's there, we have to do it. But uh, over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so, I, I've, I've been a time traveler. It's, uh, it's been a most interesting voyage. Uh, like it, it's been an incredible. Um, it's, it's been a time of discovery, and uh, I found that I've had to learn so much, and it's been great uh, having the opportunity to do that. And what I wanted to do in the paper today was make it uh, easier for you to be time travelers as well, to engage in ethno-historical sociology and uh, but to do that, you see, you, you really need a time machine. And what I hope to indicate or provide uh, are some resources and in particular a mechanism that would enable you to go back into history, different places and time, but also cross-culturally, um, transdisciplinary, there is no limit. As I sometimes tell my students, if you know symbolic interactionism, you can go anywhere, a church, a prison, a hospital, a school ground, and you'll be able to connect with the people. Because we look at what real people actually do, and so much sociology does not do that. 
It tries to reduce everything to variables and factors, becomes so mechanistic and unrealistic. And symbolic interaction, uh, I'm really talking here about the work, uh, most uh, uh, precisely here, of Herbert Bloomer, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him later on, but um, Herbert Bloomer provides a theory and methodology that enables us to go into any setting. And so for me, um, symbolic interaction has, has provided this pragmatist time machine. Now, just to put this in context a little more, uh, when we go back as time travelers, it's also nice if there's someone previously there who can provide something for us to connect with. And of course, uh, in our case, we're very fortunate because we have Plato and his student Aristotle, uh, Thucydides, uh, and, and of course, uh, among the Italian scholars, uh, None, are, none, in my view, is better than Cicero, but Quintilian is quite remarkable. Some of the early Christian uh, figures, uh, Augustine, uh, also an incredible scholar. Uh, and uh, anyways, we, we, we have these, these, uh, these points. And it turns out that a lot of the ideas that we think are relatively new or very, very new, such as postmodernism. If you go back and, and you read uh, the text from the classical Greek era, you, you will find that almost everything not only was discussed, but a lot of it was discussed much more thoroughly and precisely and reliably and understandably than many other things that are purportedly uh, new. Um, so the, uh, uh, while we're going back, you see it also is the case that there have been scholars at different points in time who've reached forward. So they've, they've uh, anticipated and enabled this whole process. Uh, so what, we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, the, the paper uh, today, I'm not going to try and read the paper to you, uh, but I, I, I will... Uh, read certain parts because I, I do want to establish uh, a, a base, um, and, and so I'll do that. But um, it, it's it's quite compacted, and I tried to put in this short statement as many resources as I could, so that anybody could go and and start doing some of this ethnographic uh, and ethno-historical research. Uh, well, I think of it, I'll also just mention, you know, I'm so glad to see European scholars um, working with symbolic interaction. And you see, a lot of people think it's that symbolic interactionism and American pragmatism are American inventions. Well, only in some ways is that true. They are fundamentally European in, in their foundations and some of the very best material that we have uh, comes from European scholars and particularly from those in the classical Greek era. So we really go back to our roots and this I will try to indicate to you that uh, very much enables what we do now and, you know, I, I was talking to a historian a, uh, a while back, and she says, you know, um, in your courses, uh, you ask people to go back. She says, I can't get them to go further back than five years. You see, there's this emphasis on nowness. It's not unique to our time. And if you go and read Durkheim, he talks about the 16th century and the so-called Renaissance, right? And he says, you know, a lot of the scholars in those days, they said, well, we, we have this stuff, but if you really want to know what's going on, I'm your person. <laughs> uh, the nowness. 
and uh, uh, it turns out over time there, there have been some people who have gone back and they said, well, you, you really should you know, read the classics and work with them and that will help you better understand what we're doing now. But others who have been very happy, they say, ah, forget them. Those, those were the old guys. New times demand new theory. It probably was good in their days, but hey, we have the steam engine. <laughs> or now we have the printing press, or whatever it is. Uh, the uh, greatest in invention, I, I guess, for humans uh, wasn't the steam engine, it wasn't the printing press, it certainly wasn't the computer. It was really something that, I don't even know if you want to call it an invention, but it was language. Language is fundamental enabling device for humans. It, it gives us all kinds of capacities. Uh, so the, the paper today, I'm just going to, first of all, I'll just indicate some of the things that are in the paper. Um, uh, there's an abstract or an overview. I tried to scrunch as much as I could into that. An introduction, and I go back uh, uh, to talk uh, about Cicero. Cicero says, to be ignorant of what has occurred before you were born is to remain always a child. For what is the worth of human life unless it is, unless it is woven into the life of our ancestors by the records of history? Cicero is not very well known in sociology but his material on oratory or rhetoric, if you will, that's the Greek uh, term, is incredible. And he does an ethno-historical project where he goes and he traces, traces the development of rhetoric from the Greeks, some of the variations to his own time and the variations there. And uh, uh, so this, this, this idea that we can uh, go back in time, uh, we had a couple of handouts. As I tell my class, I'm happy that you're here, even if you're late. <laughs> because at least you might get something worthwhile out of the day. Okay. Anyways, thank you for coming. Uh, so, um, so scholarship, and then uh, we'll talk about symbolic interaction more specifically in the study of, of uh, human group life. Uh, we'll talk a little bit too about some of the criteria for assessing ethnographic research and ethno-historical research. If you're going to do something, you should have a good sense of what it is that you're doing. And uh, uh, then uh, just a short reference to some of the historical resources because, as I sometimes tell people, if you're going into um, a war or a battle, uh, you should take your friends with you. And so to me, you see these, these sources, those are my friends. And they're my teachers. And they're my reference point. And uh, if I'm doing some things, sometimes I'll say, well, what would Aristotle think about this? What would Bloom or uh, whoever it is? So uh, anyways, we'll just uh, sort of skip through the, the uh, paper as we go along and you have a copy uh, to read. Um, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and I'll do the best I can to answer them. I, I basically like questions. Some people don't, um, but I do. Anyways, let, let's just take a, a, a little run at, uh, at, at this paper, establish some basics. Ethno-historical sociology, we're in the abstract. Um, I say it's highly instructive, it's notably informative. But something that I really want to communicate is that scholarship is a community process. Uh, it's not about me and that's really important to recognize and to try to communicate that to our students, that it's not me who makes something possible, it's not me who's brilliant. And I sometimes tell people, 
Don't worry about being brilliant. Just do the best job you can. And then people will say, well, it's not too bad, or it's good, or whatever, and you can add on from there. Uh, so ethno-historical sociology, where uh, we can compare what people were talking about in reference to human group life with what we're doing now. Where is it similar? Where is it different? Um, what are the conceptual implications? Because we always want to establish what have we been learning? And to talk about what we've been learning, we're basically talking about the concepts, the conceptual payoff. So how are we doing for time? It's okay. Oh, glass of water, thank you very much. I'm going to take my jacket off too. I'm feeling a little warm. Um, okay, so ethnographic, uh, ethno historical sociology. Uh, as I, I mentioned, we, uh, we, we go back to the Greeks and uh, uh, talked a little bit about Cicero. There's a little quotation on the bottom of the first page. Uh, this is from Herbert Bloomer. A society is seen as people meeting the varieties of situations that are thrust upon them by their conditions of life. These situations are met by working out joint actions in which participants have to align their acts to one another. Each participant does so by interpreting the acts of others and in turn making indications to others as to how they should act. So from an interactionist viewpoint, uh, people, uh, I guess the first thing to recognize is, is that in addition to language, people are doing things. Uh, people enter into the process as agents the process, the causal process. If I do this, what will happen? If I do that, how will that work out? I've tried this and it's not working out. I should try something else, making adjustments. And you see, this is what we do not find in, in so much sociology. Psychology is no better whatsoever. In fact, the real problem with psychology is that it tries to reduce everything to the quality of individuals. Uh, Bloomer, Durkheim, um, Aristotle, Plato, they recognized really that there is no individual apart from the community. Even the notion of having a self or being someone, what could you possibly imagine yourself to be if it wasn't for the language and your connection and your participation in that uh, group of people. No language, no self. No language, no thought. Rene Descartes, absolutely mistaken. What would people doubt about? Like, uh, doubt does not just exist as some inherent uh, biological capacity. So, if you can doubt, you already have some sense of language, what is and what isn't, and how things fit together and how they don't. Otherwise, it's an absurd concept. Uh, so, ethno-historical sociology, uh, for us, you see, in many ways, it's not so different from what we do as ethnographers, except we're trying to build on works that people have developed from before. Um, you know, the people in, in classics, uh, uh, classical studies, uh, I've, I've talked to a number of them and I've gone to some of their conferences and I, I remember a line where uh, someone was talking about this uh, uh, young uh, uh, professor and they're saying, you know, she has found 15 lines of text. And another one says, yes, that can make her career. Well, you know, as interactionists, uh, 15 lines of text 
isn't really very much at all. It's in fact so little uh, we would like to be able to contextualize, you know, to uh, uh, see what interpretations, meanings people had, how things are connected. And when we're doing ethno-historical sociology, uh, I would encourage you very much to look for sources that talk about things in extended detail uh, and that look at things from the viewpoints of the participants. Because if they're not doing that, whose behavior are they actually trying to explain? You see, we, we could go and hang around with a group of kids or whatever, maybe they're delinquents or something, however they might be categorized, and we might say to each other, gee, I wonder why this kid does this or that. And since, since we're pretty bright, we could come up with some rationale for them doing that. But in doing that, we're not really explaining things from their viewpoint, we're using our viewpoint. And you can't really explain somebody's behavior or activities or worldviews very well from ours. A lot of times we have trouble explaining our own things to ourselves. And uh, so there, there's this idea, let's, let's look at things from the viewpoint uh, of the other. And, and some of the uh, authors have provided us with this really valuable material. Um, and those are the people that I would suggest we uh, try to key on. Um, and really that there are no viable alternatives uh, to, uh, to ethnographic research of some sort. Uh, Little thing I, I put down, this is on the bottom of page two, uh, ethno-historical inquiry and analysis provide a much needed memory for sociology. And you see, if we're gonna understand the human community, we really need to go back and follow the developmental flows. How did things develop? What happened here, there? And understand that where we are now wasn't just something that we all collectively came up with, but rather uh, we, we've all benefited from the things that we've learned from other people and they in turn, uh, things have gotten passed along, not necessarily wisely. In fact, a lot of things that haven't been very viable have been passed on to us. Uh, if, if you go in, the, let's say again, the 16th century Renaissance, it was primarily an artistic, poetic kind of Renaissance. It wasn't philosophical. And uh, they also weren't aware that the significance of Aristotle in the classical Greek era, Aristotle was, was Plato's student. But you see later they sort of reversed it. They took Plato and they critiqued Aristotle with Plato's works. And they're, they're, they're both very, very valuable to us, but we need to recognize distinctions. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll hear people and they'll say, oh, you know, uh, Plato was an idealist and Aristotle was a, an objectivist. Done, right? Well, somebody ever tells you that, they, they know almost nothing about Plato and almost nothing about Aristotle. Uh, their, their works are so uh, uh, detailed and there's so many different perspectives that they offer and viewpoints and so much sustained, careful, thoughtful analysis. And, and, and when you're reading things as an, as an ethnographer, well, if you're reading historical materials, I'd say, Try to read it like you're an ethnographer. You see, you would like to contextualize. You'd like to look at things from their viewpoint. You'd like to be mindful of that community that the author was in and how he or she connected with those uh, people. And you, you want to go back into their life worlds as much as you can. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, skipping along a little bit. I, I'm not worried about following the flow so much because you have the paper. You can read it at your leisure, and I, I hope you will. Uh, but, you know, following the flows of Western social thought, um, you know, many, many times I had heard, well, you know, 
um, uh, the classical Greeks were the uh, cradle of Western civilization. But I really didn't understand what that meant until I went back and started studying classical Greek thought in more detail. And I was totally amazed at how many ideas I, I thought were you know, more recent. And uh, yes, folks, only in America would you find uh, pragmatism. Yes, because it's, it's a frontier land. It, it's um, individuality. Uh, da, 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 da. And, and you read one book after another and they tell you the same thing because people haven't gone back, you see. And if you don't have a memory, as Cicero says, of what happened earlier, you're, you're not gonna know what, what's novel and, and, and what's been repeated and what's been changed. Uh, uh, again, you know, if you, if you read Plato and Aristotle, you're, you're gonna know the basis of every major thought in the social sciences and humanities over the last 2,500 years. And you'll say, okay, uh, uh, this, this one uh, didn't get this quite right, or this got changed, this got dropped out. Uh, and, and there's so many incredible resources that we just have lost track of because others have said, ah, eh, those old guys, you know, what did they know? Look, we, we have cell phones. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you ever see people count in, in stores, grocery stores now? You know, they, they are going to give you change. It's all counted out. They take it like this. Okay, hold your hand out. They're going to drop it off. They used to count change, you know. Now, they can't count. Uh, high school students don't know their six times time. time, time <laughs> they don't know their six times. Six times, <laughs> they're six by six timetables. Uh, and it's easy, you know, for, for them to get by and, and uh, they, they know things their parents don't, of course, but a lot of things they uh, uh, don't know. Uh, the, the early Greeks, one, one, of the, one of the big advantages that they had the classical Greeks, uh, there are earlier Greeks before the classical era, but um, they, had a, they developed a phonetic alphabet. That was so important. You know, there, uh, I, I would say there are really three great civilizations, uh, the Chinese, the Indian, and, and, and the Greeks. You might say, well, what about the Egyptians? Well, the Egyptians had hieroglyphics, and it's very, very difficult to interpret but the others had versions of what I would call pragmatist social thought. But it was really the classical Greeks that had the most precise and enabling uh, alphabet, the phonetic alphabet. And, and that enabled so much in terms of their scholarship. But the uh, early Greeks, uh, again, looked at life in terms of the community, and it was the individual within the community. And that's something that's so central and important for us as symbolic interactionists, to be mindful of people are community creatures. And of course, you can have various life worlds or subcultures, each life world, um, a set of perspectives or viewpoints, identities, relationships, objects, um, different senses of emotionality, ways of expressing things, and, and that's all part of uh, uh, what we uh, wish to attend to. Uh, page four, uh, I talk here about uh, symbolic interactionism, uh, more, more precisely uh, making reference to Herbert Bloomer. And uh, Herbert Bloomer, uh, a lot of people will say, well, here's, here's Herbert Bloomer, and they say, here are the three basic premises. Now that you know Bloomer, we can focus on something else. Well, uh, if you actually go and, and read Herbert Bloomer's book, Symbolic Interactionism, in more sustained detail, and, and I'm referring here more specifically to the very first uh, paper in that, that, that set, where he looks at the theory and methodology of symbolic interaction. And 
in that chapter, you will find that he's very critical of uh, much of what passes uh, for social thought uh, from philosophy, psychology, and sociology. And uh, it, it's, it's not, uh, you know, he, it's not the case that Bloomer's trying to nitpick with these people, but rather he's saying, if we are going to study human society in scientific terms, we should be very attentive to what actually goes on. We should be examining things in close detail. You can't have a science if you don't examine instances of things. Uh, you, you've, you've all been familiar with the quantitative literature and sociology. I'll just take Emil Durkheim's suicide. How many suicides is Emil Durkheim in that text intimately familiar with? 500, 300, 2,000, how about none? And that's what the social sciences have been modeled on, the ones who are doing survey research. And then they want to make inferences. We have this as data, and look, this is, uh, this is significant at this, uh, this level of association and this uh, level of uh, significance. And now we have to speculate. How is it that more crime is committed, committed by this group of people rather than that group of people? Do they hang around this group of people or that group of people? Nope. They don't want to. Well, they're smelly. They're dirty, they might uh, take my wallet or something. You want to know about uh, thieves? Hang around thieves. You want to know about people studying nanotechnology? Go where they are. It's fascinating stuff. And you see, we can do that. We don't have to be scientists. We're talking to scientists just like we would talk to school teachers or strippers or whatever else you might think is appropriate as your subject uh, matter. But the idea, as Bloomer's saying, is study things in instances. See what they do. They're trying to do things. You can't have a society without people doing things. How are they relating to others? You look at the marketplace. Um, we, we have a number of malls in this, this city. Well, it's people relating to one another. And if you go to the back regions of each store, it gets even much more interesting because they're dealing with suppliers, right? They're, they're, they're dealing with staff, trying to educate them on what to do and maintain uh, positive outlooks and all these other things. Um, pricing, well, it seems like, uh, well, they have formulas. You just double or whatever. But then when you actually look at what goes on, uh, buyer-supplier relationships, pricing, dealing with uh, troublesome customers, repeat customers or whatever, it's all social process. It's people relating to others. Do you know how they sell cities? We have these people, they call them economic developers or business developers. I, I had a certification as being a business developer. I spent enough time hanging around these people, interviewing them, and they, they kind of gave me like an honorary certification. Yeah, I, I have like a, it's not a diploma, but yeah. Uh, and I'll tell you how they sell cities. They sell cities the same way people sell shoes, the same way that they sell automobiles the same way they sell coffees. Images, images, images. And they want to relate to those, those people. And people who are locating new plants or whatever, uh, they're going, they're investing in some land or some structure because of the images that they have. If, if you have high unemployment in your city, and you're the business development officer, you say, you know, 
If you go to a lot of places, you're going to have problems getting a, a workforce. Our people need work. We're ready to go. This is the place for you. If, however, uh, you, you have a very low level of, um, of unemployment, you say, this is the place you should be. Our people are so good, so industrious, so responsible. Everybody wants to be here. Or, you know what? Toyota just located in our area. Wouldn't you like to be where they are? Yes, images. It's, it's not so different in other areas. Physicians give you the latest medication. The salesperson came by and they said, well, this and this and this. Um, I, I, I was talking with, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I was in the coffee shop. I spend a lot of time in coffee shops because that's where the people are. And, you know, I'm supposed to be some kind of sociologist. And if I just sit in my office looking at the wall, it's not too inspiring. But in the coffee shop, I, I see people. They have their ups and downs and, you know, friendships, animosities. They, they get frustrated or whatever else. They're excited. Keeps me... Uh, I keep being reminded of what people are all about. And as, as, as there one, one day, and there, there, there were four or five guys, outpatients from a psychiatric uh, hospital. And uh, the one says, oh, what are you taking? And the other one says, I'm taking such and such. Well, what are you taking that for? And the other one says, well, that's what Dr. So-and-so told me to take. He said, well, what are you listening to him for? He's nothing but a goddamn pill pusher. And uh, you should get this. Next time you tell him you want this, and the other one says, okay, I, I will do that. And you know what? Um, psychiatrists are pill pushers. Well, if they're not you know, more involved in other kinds of activities, but uh, yeah. Uh, if, if you have uh, chronic Lyme disease, a lot of doctors want to send you to see a psychiatrist. Well, they, they know all the, the uh, sedatives, the, the uh, um, painkillers. Uh, yeah, it, it's, that's part of their, their tools. Take some of these, Lyrica or whatever, try some Trazodone if you're having problems sleeping. And uh, lorazepam, listen, this, uh, this, this, this will help settle you down. And it really does. I'm not saying those, those things don't have those kind of effects. But they don't really solve your problem. But nevertheless, it's, it's marketing and sales and people build on what they do. And, uh, so those fellows uh, who, who were there, they, the one guy had a pretty good sense of what goes on. Uh, and, and you see, we, we want to be attentive to that, and, and we want to look at all these different areas uh, of, of time. And Herbert Bloomer is saying, well, if we're going to study group life, we need to define our terms of reference. We need to lay out what are our premises. We need to examine things in the instances and see what actually happens over a process and see how things fit together. We need to do comparative analysis. Where is this similar and where is this different? And then what are the implications of that? And we need to try and arrive at some concepts. Herbert Bloomer says a science without concepts, it's like a mammal without bones. It, it, it's like a love story without love. Um, it's like a train without a track. He says, a science without concepts would be an impossible thing. And of course, concepts. And Durkheim, you know, in his uh, elementary forms of the religious life, which is entirely different from division of labor, it's entirely different, pretty well different from rules, and entirely uh, 
different from suicide, uh, Durkheim says the concepts are the keys to communication and all of our lives are organized around these concepts. What connects with what? What can do what? Uh, where do we get some sense of direction without uh, concepts? Um, so Bloomer says, now if you take these same things and now you apply them to these other approaches, are they doing things scientifically? Answer, most of them aren't. And that's where his criticisms are of quantitative research, of so much uh, uh, um, theory uh, 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 and in psychology, sociology, and philosophy because the people involved in these are really not specifying their premises. You know, one, one of the uh, big words these days is power and empower all. Oh just kind of hits me after a while. It's like high school kids learning the F word and they just kind of use it. And am I cool or what? Right? We're, um, and you see what Bloomer is, is saying is that we need to define our terms of, of reference. We, we need to assume this kind of responsibility in, in what we're doing. And if, if we're not doing those things, um, it can be entertaining. Uh, it, it can be used for activist uh, research, activist policies or whatever. It can generate change. You know, it's basically rhetoric. But let's not confuse that with, with what is a more sustained, careful, scientific approach to things. And you realize Bloomer is not saying you need to be quantitative to be scientific. He's actually saying there are times in which being quantitative takes you far away from what it is that you're actually purporting to study. So the interactionists, the pragmatists, they, they've never been opposed to science. They just uh, are, are taking the viewpoint that if you want to study human behavior, you need to recognize that people are, are different from other objects. And of course, they, they weren't the first to do this. Uh, uh, Plato and Aristotle talk about this. Uh, Wilhelm Diltai um, uh, says, you know, we make a distinction between Geistewissenschaften uh, and Naturwissenschaften. Did I do that okay? No. Not bad. <laughs> it's better than my, my, my Polish, unfortunately. <laughs> But uh, I, I, I was actually uh, learning to say uh, thank you, uh, Jing Queer. Uh, but I, I, would, I found myself saying it more, more like as Chinese. And I say, Jing Queer? <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, uh, just a little aside. When, when I was in grade school, high school, not in the first grade rather, I flunked phonics. So it's really an extension of that. I didn't know what phonics was. Neither did my, my parents, but I, I knew I'd failed something. But here I was a kid failing sounds. Uh, okay, uh, uh, methodologically, uh, uh, in terms of uh, judging ethnographic research and ethno-historical uh, research, trying to qualify things, if you go to page six, there, there's a little list of um, 12 points. Um, things that you might use to decide, is this quality or is it not? Uh, and uh, then uh, on, on page six, there's a section on generic social processes. Uh, generic social processes simply refer to, to concepts that are applicable across a wide range of settings. So the idea is you could take these, uh, these, these same uh, processes and, and wherever you go, uh, if you're in a hospital, uh, if, if you're in a church, if you're in a playground, if you're 
hanging around with, with people who, who are in yoga, um, <laughs> uh, or, or uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, kids on a, a playground, it, it can be school settings, uh, scientists, uh, people in music or art. Uh, you can take these and they serve as sensitizing concepts, like perspectives, what are the viewpoints, how do people in this group make sense of this and that, what is whatness for, for them, and, and what's important, and how do things fit together. Another concept we look at is people acquiring identities, uh, being somebody within the setting, self-other identities, how are people defining each other and themselves, and how does this connect with activities, and of course activities, what are the things that people actually do? And then we take each activity, um, break them into parts, follow them along, and what can we learn about this relationship? Similarly, um, people uh, acquiring linguistic fluency, the language of the group. Uh, uh, we, we've been spending a lot of time dealing with uh, chronic Lyme disease, and. I, I know a whole lot about the pharmaceutical community that I didn't know before. It's learning the language, right? Uh, learning a lot about alternative health care. Uh, learning a lot about herbal uh, remedies for things. Uh, learning a lot about diets and <laughs> many things I really had no interest in, including chronic Lyme disease. I didn't even know what Lyme disease was. And then you just find out about that and some of the things that go on. Uh, so these generic, generic social processes, they're so nice, you see, instead of uh, telling one of your students, well, go out and observe figure skaters. Okay. Uh, well, this one, five minutes. Okay. Thank you. I, I was wondering how we're doing time-wise. I was afraid to ask. Uh, so, you see, someone could you say you're studying figure skaters or, or people in ballet or whatever, so they're going to go and, well, this, this one did some, they call them pirouettes. Okay, that's good. And, and some people were cheering or whatever. You see, if you have concepts, you have ways of making sense of things. If, if you're a biologist and someone's now going to show you uh, some fish in an aquarium and talk to you about things. Oh, they can make sense of a lot of things and explain to you what this is and that and how this works. And uh, If you don't have concepts, uh, you, you really don't know what's going on. But each group has their own viewpoint and they kind of privilege those within each, each group. That becomes objective reality because others agree, they act towards it, and it's real. So from our viewpoint, you see, well, I'm not telling you anything new, um, it's this notion that, and, and here I go back to Alfred Schutz, the uh, phenomenological sociologist, multiple realities, right? That each group has their own sense of reality, what is, what isn't, what's ambiguous, their own explanations for things, and newcomers, they sort of get fitted into that. And they're given now a way of being somebody, of knowing what's going on, and uh, very, very consequential. Um, five, five minutes, okay. Um, if we're, we're, we're on page uh, seven, roughly. I, I've, I've gone all, all over the place, but the whole world, you see, it, it's not in parts, it's really, there's so much more unity to that and, and it's uh, good to, to, to be mindful of that. Uh, some of the uh, sets of concepts, uh, generic social processes, engaging in subcultural life worlds, um, and, and we can break all of these up. Uh, we talked a little bit about that. Careers of participation. It's so good to understand how do people become involved in something initially? When are they likely to continue, become more intensively involved? 
uh, they could drop out or, or leave, become disinvolved. And of course, people get back into things. So career contingencies, you see, just like people could have careers as doctors or teachers or lawyers, so they can have careers as, as uh, uh, gang members, they can have careers as drug users, uh, they can have careers as drug dispensers, okay. psychiatrists. Uh, and, but to see what we learn in one group, we can start to say, well, how similar or different is it to what people do in these other groups? And then you start to develop a fuller appreciation of the many different ways that people can get involved in things. Now, can we categorize them? Can we reduce them to maybe three or four types? So we, we can talk, for example, about seekership, where, where people develop some interest. And now, I would like to be a symbolic interactionist when I grow up, right? Forget about football and soccer and all those other things. Anybody who's anybody. <laughs> okay, uh, recruitment. Um, or others try to get you involved in things. I mentioned to you before economic development. They have trade shows where, where they have their booths. Different cities, different provinces, different countries. Come here, come there, we will give you this, these kinds of concessions. Let's make a deal, right? Um, so um, recruitment, secretship, uh, also, sometimes people do things and they don't want to do them, but they don't have any choice. We use the term closure. I think I have one, one minute. Okay, uh, we can handle a minute. And, and also, how do people uh, deal with reservations that they have? You know, where you're told you shouldn't do this, but it sure looks like fun. Uh, okay, the last, uh, the last 45 seconds that I have... Uh, the ethno-historical resources, I, I divided these into two categories. Uh, and, and in the first one, you really need to add their Aristotle and Plato. Uh, uh, they're they're, they're so, such consequential resources. And then in between, so many other sources. Uh, there's an article that I, I wrote in 2004. If you get access to, to this, if you could email me, I'll send you a copy. Uh, but it, it basically traces, it, it's like an overview from the Greeks to the Romans, to the Christians, to the Western Europeans, to our uh, present time. Uh, lots and lots of sources. Uh, then the other category, uh, ethno-historical resources. Uh, basically, these are papers that I've done in the area of ethno-historical sociology. And uh, to me, there's been so much uh, that's just been so enabling. I, I've learned about memory. Uh, I've, I've learned about emotionality far beyond anything that I found in the present day literature. Um, character. I'm, I'm learning a lot about character. And um, ambiguity is a, is a generic phenomenon. Dealing with ambiguity. Human life is filled with ambiguity. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, from Cicero, uh, I, I, I've learned about doubting and, and also about knowing. You see that looking at doubting is a process, looking at knowing is a process, and how do people connect in, in those different ways. So I think my minute is about up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for putting up with me. Do I get questions? Uh, yes, and okay. uh, if you have uh, some questions, comments, please, we still have time. Yes, uh, Tadeusz. Wait, wait. You see, ambiguity. People are always making adjustments, and Bloomer talks no. specifically yes. Yes, about that. Okay. 
Thanks. So, I know uh, Rob from a long time. Rob was actually the, the reason why uh, I'm sort of here, because you gave in the early 90s a leaflet to Rob Shields. You know who Rob Shields was? He's a famous geographer. He g I met him, he gave it to me, and th therefore I came to the qualitatives. But that's not the question. That's just uh, relating each other. Um, so you can r roughly say that your career falls in two parts, if I may say so. The ethnographic scrounger, uh, the, the urban guy walking around, seeing the hustlers, all these things, and you know other things, and more a scholarly approach where you sort of like go through the classical uh, reading, so to speak. And my question is this, in hindsight, would you have done these ethnographies different with the knowledge you have now gained from reading the works of Cicero, uh, Aristotle, uh, Socrates, uh, and so on? I, I know it's a hypothetical, but I'm just curious. Like, Sure. No, that, that's a very interesting question. You know, one of the things that uh, I've thought in relationship to that, Bloomer uh, really didn't know his, his Greek literature, uh, I'd say almost at all. But it also turns out that neither did Mead, neither did Dewey, neither did William James, the American pragmatists. And I, I thought they did because they're philosophers, right? And you'd think, well, wouldn't the philosophers uh, know the great uh, philosophers uh, from the Greek era? And if you go look at John Dewey's uh, ethics, it's embarrassing com compared to what Aristotle uh, did in Nicomachean ethics. They're, they're just a world of difference. Uh, George Herbert Mead uh, is critical of the Greeks here and there. Uh, in mind, self, and society, but he didn't recognize that they uh, anticipated a lot of things of Darwin's theory. Um, and you see, at that time, Mead was caught up in it. But to go back to your, your question, would I have done things differently? There's really a lot of consistency between what I did earlier, working with Bloomer in the Chicago School, and, and what I encountered uh, in the classical, uh, let's say, Greek literature, uh, I think I would have done things a lot better. Uh, but uh, the idea of going and, and uh, relating to people, uh, I, I was uh, uh, surprised in a way to come across uh, some of the literature from the Greek historians, um, Herodotus, um, on uh, histories, um, Thucydides, who's an incredible scholar on um, the, the Peloponnesian War, and Xenophon, a uh, lesser account on what he calls Anabases or the Persian Expedition. But uh, uh, I, I also did a comparative analysis between those three historians and what we have done as ethnographers in the Chicago tradition, so basically the last century. Uh, that, that's one of the papers that I, I wrote. And uh, I indicated that none of the ethnographers that we have in the 20th century provided a statement as thorough as Thucydides, the history of the Peloponnesian War. And there's just so much that we can learn from them. Uh, I, I mentioned emotionality before. Uh, uh, Aristotle's uh, uh, rhetoric, there, there's material there on emotionality that just blows things away. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll just mention one other little thing. When I read rhetoric, Aristotle's rhetoric, that was the first book I actually read from, from the classical Greek era. I was just totally amazed. I'm supposed to be some kind of labeling theorist. You know, how do people acquire identities and reputations? If uh, someone had come to me and said, here's my dissertation, I would have said, wow, this is great stuff. I, I'm just, you know, blown away by it. But maybe you could add some, some references, you know, to Lemert and Goffman. <laughs> uh, because, uh, you know, people like to see some contemporary references. 
Uh, did, did they anticipate Goffman? Oh, without doubt. It turns out that uh, uh, um, Kenneth Burke, on whose work Irving Goffman built, Kenneth Burke uh, had, had been reading Aristotle and Plato and uh, a lot of the things that he develops in the dramaturgical frame um, I, I read of the classical Greek and, and Latin eras. I had no idea whatsoever. But uh, uh, so process, activity, relationships. Um, Aristotle uh, did a, a really nice book, Poetics, where he looks at images and impression management and consistencies, um, discrepancies. Um, Irving Goffman mentions uh, reading some the classical literature. I, I don't know how much he ever read, but uh, uh, I think he references Homer in, in, in uh, uh, presentation of self. But uh, um, it, it's, uh, there, there, there's so much there on, on, on theater and meaning making and deviance and uh, uh, if, if you go to the last set of resources, uh, uh, the nine, I, I just had a paper come out in 2017 um, on, uh, on Kenneth Burke and his connectedness with American, with, uh, pardon me, symbolic interactionism. Uh, so I think it would have been a lot better, Thaddeus, uh, at, but uh, um, so much. But there was a lot of consistency, and in some ways, that work enabled me to make more sense of, of the literature from the Greeks. And you see, that's one of the reasons I, I suggest that you might like to start with Bloomer and, and then go back to the classical Greek era because there's much more um, coherence in, in Bloomer's work. And, and when you go there, you'll see that, oh yes, they had this and this and this. But uh, for the modern mind, it's more challenging uh, to read um, the classical Greeks. But the writing is remarkable. Um, sure. Yes, I have to, yes, not, not question, but probably curiosity. And sure, curiosity is good. Yes, I like that. Okay. And my professor was um, perhaps one of the most important um, a uh, scholar in uh, classical sociology and he used to say that uh, the classics has have written and said all it is important to know about the present day i think that he was exaggerating a little bit but um, but there is uh, some true in oh. what he said and the two curiosity the first one i I appreciated your reference to um, Greek uh, thoughts, um, but I was asking myself um, uh, something concerning Heraclitus or Heraclitus, that is um, one of the most studied philosopher in Italian school, that is the philosopher who said that Pantarei, that all is flowing, and you cannot uh, enter twice in the same river, not, mm -hmm. not because you cannot, you are not able, but because the water is different. So yes. I think is, it, it could be very important from, for a pragmatist uh, way of thinking to um, valorize also sure. Heraclitus. So I like, ask okay. a, a comment from you. Sure. And the second question is, Surely you know that uh, 2017 is a very important year, obviously because of the conference uh, in, here at the University of Łódź, but uh, also because uh, 100 years ago Durkheim died in Paris in 1917. And this was because uh, my professor was a classic, so, classic so, scholar, so I remember that. But uh, Herbert Bloomer died 30 years ago, if I'm not wrong. 
I think it was 1987. 87, perhaps. Yes, I think we can, we can check this. And it is interesting, our uncertainty, because I, uh, probably I'm wrong. Oops. But uh, uh, if I'm right... Actually, uh, you, you're I, probably right, because we had a conference in 1984 hmm. that we dedicated to Herbert Blumer. 87? Yes, I'm right. Yes, thank you very much for... <laughs> so what and, do I know about it? Yes, <laughs> and my question, I, yes, is, is not to say I'm a, no, no, no. a very spectacular I'm man. Um, if, but, but because uh, if I'm not wrong, I have not seen any seminar or conference here and there in Europe or in the United States concerning Herbert Blumer because sometimes we say, hmm, Durkheim died 100 years ago, so we have a conference or a seminar on Durkheim. Uh, Blumer died 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So my question is probably, my, probably Herbert Blumer died too recently because we have to wait 100 years to, to organize a conference of Bloomer. And the second answer that I gave is probably because for us, as interactionists, Bloomer is not considered a classic, but as a sort of living presence um, among us. But Perhaps you have a more clever and intelligent answer than mine. Um, not necessarily more clever and certainly not more intelligent, but uh, uh, I will go back to the first question, uh, the idea that um, uh, you can't step into the same river twice because it's always changing. Pragmatically, uh, you might want to cross that river and you're not going to worry about whether it's the first time or second time or you can't. But the uh, Greeks de debated uh, whether everything was always changing and, or whether everything was, was uh, continuous or, pardon me, unchanging, but we just had the impression of uh, changing. Uh, and there, there was the position uh, uh, you can't really know anything because if everything is always changing, nothing ever is. And if nothing ever is, how can you know that which never is? Aristotle's way of dealing with this is that, yes, things are always changing, but things do not change at the same rate. So we know the changing in, in relative terms, that is changing relative to slower changing. And uh, uh, so that, that, was, that was his way around it. Aristotle, you know, uh, was very much a relativist. And he said that nothing has any meaning except relative to what you compare it to. So you see, when people say Aristotle was an objectivist, there's some truth to that in the sense that he was scientifically minded. He did want to check everything out, but he is also aware of the relative nature of human group life and in the physio physical world, uh, the material world, um, things could be compared to something else. Um, is this heavy? Well, compared to me, it's heavy. But compared to this wall, this is not heavy. So all these concepts of place and time, um, he, he would see them as, as relative. Um, but uh, nevertheless, very interesting. How do we deal with the changing and the unchanging? And that's part of what we're struggling with of course, and the idea to follow the developmental flows and yet be mindful what goes on in terms of connections. And, uh, but something else, just to go back to what we were talking about earlier, 
recognizing the ways that people can enter into the causal process. You see, in much psychology and sociology, it's sort of like our behavior is extruded. Either there are forces inside sort of pushing things out of us or external forces and we're sort of extruded like uh, pasta through a pasta machine. Uh, uh, I'll just make quick reference to Herbert Bloomer. Uh, you know, Herbert Bloomer, uh, uh, to my mind, the, the, the most significant thing is not when he was born or when he died, and I know, I know you're agreeing with, with me, so I'm not... Uh, 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 the most significant thing is what he gave us. And his book, Symbolic Interactionism, was it came out in 1969. He had been working with these ideas uh, since he, he was uh, a graduate student uh, because his dissertation, 1928, uh, looks at the nature of social psychology, which incidentally has hardly changed in, in, in the almost almost 100 years, but uh, uh, his 1969 book, uh, which for him was really putting together a lot of ideas he had been working with, things he had been learning about as a student and an instructor at Chicago. Uh, in 2019, that book will be around for, do I have this right, for, tw for 50 years? Is that right? I think we should have a conference in 2019 focusing on Herbert Bloomer's symbolic interactionism. And we're better to hold it than in the heart of symbolic interactionism, Europe. <laughs> and, uh, it, it's, it's, it's unlikely that we will be back at, at Woods because it's so much work to put together a conference. and. Uh, but I just thought that would be a nice theme. Um. Okay, uh, I see that some more people want to uh, comment or ask, but we are just over the time. Then I use only one minute for me oh, to sure. comment. But we will discuss later uh, uh, in the lobby. Uh, I. I have such question. Uh, who is interpreter? Who is this guy who makes this uh, historical, ethno-historical, uh, ethnographic uh, research? This is very important. Uh, how he is located in the historical uh, place, position, and so on. Uh, I think that what I thought during your lecture that we could do such a research concerning Heidegger, for example, also, and his influence or our thinking and the background and the context of Heidegger that influenced his thoughts. Uh, we could do it uh, easily considering Sartre and Foucault. I read the book uh, in Polish, is Foucault in Warsaw. We don't know anything what he did in Warsaw. He was one year or two, but the, one of the uh, journalists did wonderful research, ethnographical uh, research, uh, research about his staying, and we could see how his biographical experience in communist Poland being homosexual at that time influenced his book, his doctoral thesis that he wrote in Poland. Uh, and I think that we can come uh, closer to our time doing such a social uh, ethnographic research. If I understood well what you want to uh, reconstruct from these ancient philosophers' uh, writings. And another thing is, I, I, I thought about Buddhism and Buddhist and Indian tradition, and we know from Symbolic Interaction one article uh, about no-self, and referring to the Buddhism, 
Uh, and we can find in this tradition many uh, references to symbolic interactionism. Uh, it's amazing. There was a philosopher, Nagarjuna, uh, first and second century uh, AD in India, and he said about language that if we don't change the language, uh, we don't change the ontology, we don't change epistemology of reconstructing the, the life, that the language before Wittgenstein and all these symbolic interactionists was already analyzed as a tool of creating the reality. Then, but the language historically changed and, we, and when we come back to this ancient philosophers, I'm not sure if we, we can uh, fully reconstruct the meanings of these concepts uh, from our perspective. Then I'm coming the same with Indian and uh, Buddhist tradition. Then I'm coming back to the, uh, to the first question. Who is the interpreter? Where are he, how he can locate himself in the historical process and say something trans contextual about the past that is also historically embedded. Uh, these writings are historically embedded in the past. And maybe I shouldn't do it, but it was... True. Uh, I, I we, we will talk outside or you want to reply? Oh, actually, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, try, I'll try to keep it brief. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. But very brief, please. Sure. Okay, um, in terms of, um, of, of the approach, one of the things that I tried to be very careful was to establish um, Herbert Bloomer's symbolic interactionism as a pragmatist uh, starting point for ethno-historical sociology. And the reason that I wanted to do that was because of the particular attentiveness of the interactionists to the people who are saying things and to try and look at things from their viewpoint. It differs, for example, from Max Weber's, which you want to call it, ethno-historical work on religion. You see, he, he's doing something, I think, closer to what you asked me about with regards uh, to Wittgenstein. Uh, um, with Bloomer, he's trying to establish some criteria. Um, the criteria, we, we, we want as much text as we can from the person, as much explanatory material as we can get. We, we want to contextualize it in terms of the other people, and we, we want to be mindful of... Um, uh, tending to process, identities, relationships, those sorts of things. And a lot of journalists, they can be very good, but they don't attend to those things. They often endeavor to make somebody look good or to condemn them. Uh, and uh, there, there's this matter of trying to respect our subject matter as much as we can. Interpretation is always going to be a problematic issue. But if you can find several texts that someone wrote and there's coherence across it, then you can use that as a base for assessing things. If you have other people in that context who are dealing with similar kinds of issues, uh, so um, in Plato and Ara uh, Aristotle's uh, time, there, there was uh, another scholar, Isocrates or Isocrates. It's not Socrates, he was also one of Socrates' students. And if he is providing some similar things with Plato and Aristotle, then you're more able uh, to contextualize that. Um, the more material you, you have, the more detailed they, uh, it is, the more explicit they are in terms of what they're saying. Plato and Aristotle, they write to be understood. 
that's such a big advantage. Um, the postmodernists, I don't know who they write for, uh, but they claim that if you're, I guess, a member of the high gods or goddesses, you can understand them. Uh, Garfinkel, as much as I like his work, uh, is open to that same criticism, uh, the term indexicality, which is very central to his work. Um, he never really defines it. Uh, but uh, within the um, ethno-methods community, there's so much that's consistent with what we do as interactionists, except for conversational analysis, where they introduce structures and it takes on a different quality. But uh, um, just trying to think. I probably missed something, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Obviously, the conference today will be a little bit uh, longer. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, and see you after 15 minutes.